remember? Eighteen fifty two. <laughs> Five months, twenty one days. It was I, James Nickel Forbes, captain of the Marco Polo. December 26th, 1852. I witnessed the making of a legend. My name is Charles, and I'm with the Illustrated London News. The Marco Polo has just circumnavigated the globe in less than six months. She is the Queen of the Seas. A new age of travel has begun. You, my dear, have made many people famous. From sea captains to businessmen, to writers and musicians. You were always so generous, but you were also a real thoroughbred. I, James Smith, made you that way. You outperformed every other ship man had made. Your strength showed in your sticks and spars, your lines and curves, and yes, my dear, your stern, too. You were my lady. But ambition drove you away to become queen of the seas. And now, over 150 years later, your legend is still alive. Not only that, there's a young man in St. John, New Brunswick, from where you come, who has a dream. Barry's dream is to build a replica of you, my dear, the Marco Polo II. His dream is a big one. He wants to build a tall ship in an age where ships, my dear, are carrying explorers to the moon and beyond. A tall ship. You would be Canada's ambassador to the world. A reminder of our great history during the golden age of sail. We were the best. The size of the Marco Polo is about three times the size of the Blue Nose. She's about eight feet above the Hilton Hotel here in St. John. It's 23,000 square feet of sail. And uh, she would certainly fill up this slip. In the 1830s, a man named James Smith arrived in St. John to build ships. And this is James Smith. James Smith was a very religious man, uh, believed in what he did. Once he had a goal, he, he set forth on it. Now, his first few ships were mediocre. Eventually, he built a ship, started a ship in 1850 called the Marco Polo. And what he did was, he was very creative and imaginative, and he took sort of all the ideas around him and he tried something new. And what James Smith did was he took the underwater lines of the Speedy Clipper, and he took the timber drogger, which was big in the midships, and he combined the two. And, and in that time, James Smith and the other shipbuilders use their creativity, their imagination, and their entrepreneurship to go out and create wealth. There's a number of retired, recent retired people who uh, have come forward from the dry dock, engineers and such, and said, we would love to help you. So there's a lot of expertise here. I mean, we are the best at this in the world. Premier said to us a long time ago, I'll put in 60. The feds came in with 60, see if you can match that. And we raised $250,000 and to match their 120, 
and so the design package is all, all finished. Now, that's all been approved by Lloyd's of London. There's no ship in North or South America that have reached those approvals. We've now talked to steel companies, paint companies, all kinds of companies from around the world who would like to get in on the PR. Oh, I just thought you wanted me to leave. Oh, no. We're working with the Mint right now for a year on the, uh, for a coin on the year 2001, 2002. We've also touched base with the post office. They're a little harder to work with. Oh, wow, that's great. Okay, how much is that? Uh, it's uh, 28.89. The ship is now a symbol of Canada. Jim Stewart, 17 New Brunswick musicians, sat down and wrote and produced the Marco Polo Suite. And this is now played in about six countries, and the last count we had was about 180 radio stations. Tuesday mornings. I still look forward to Tuesday mornings when these young rascals from different schools come to the museum for a bit of culture. Remember not to touch the model. Just look. Yes. Just take a minute and just look at the details, yes. Oh no, it's in an earlier stage. You can stretch yeah, the Marco Polo has it all. Which is sort of nice because you can see how the ribs were put up in the ship. See that? That must have took a long neat. time to wash those. Yeah, because it was all done by, by hand, hand, right? Even yeah. look here, with the yeah, little derrick that they had set up. Yeah. Did they glue this Can wood you? together? That would have been all glued together, yeah. Wow. Glued together. Well, they never glued it you together. You can see how the wide room. it is. You see how wide it is? Yeah. Why do you suppose it was so wide? Can you remember that what it was so used for? Yeah, because it was a cargo vessel. That's right. Is that James Smith over there? Yes. Yeah, that's his portrait. You can take a close look at it. Come, come, and I'll take a close look at you. Can you see the Marco Polo in the background, up in the right-hand corner? Yeah. Have any of you ever been to sea? I believe it is. Do you fear God? The best the of our knowledge it is, yeah. So it makes it very special, doesn't it? The man who created the Marco Polo? Yeah. Is that why it's here? That's why it's here, that's right. Because you don't always have the wind directly behind you, so you have to adjust your sails to make you go in the right Does direction. Does this boat have a motor? No, it no. doesn't. <laughs> no, it didn't have any motor. The young ones don't know much about ships, but then again, I know nothing about cars and airplanes, not to mention spaceships. And you see the, the smokestack up here? You and I are relics of the past. However, you are still the main attraction of this museum. Yeah. Let's give you some ideas for yours. Yeah? Ideas? That's great. The young ones in my time were already apprenticing as carpenters' helpers, carrying tea to the men, and some were already at sea, learning the ropes and risking their lives to become first class seamen. And see, that's what sometimes caused fires, because you had to do that. You needed the fire for that. And look at all the sawdust and everything around. Just, you know, spark hits that and it was gone. And that's what happened to James Smith's shipyard but five years after Marco Polo was built. There was fire. Caught you have to bring that up, huh? The fire. Lost my shipyard. I had a ship in the stocks and lost another at sea. All around it was a terrible year, 1855. It'd be nice just to close your eyes and go back there for a little time, yeah. you think? Yeah, just, yeah. just launching the ship. Yeah, that just be there for the launch. If you could go back yeah. for any part of it, what part would you go back for? For the launching. For the launching? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I think I would too. Or for the sinking. Where the Marsh Creek waters meet Courtney Bay, heave around and let her fly. James Smith Yard, a keel did lay. There's no ship here can match her. She was launched with a groan and thud. She's like a demon sailing by. She's stuck two weeks in the Marsh Creek mud. There's no ship here can catch her. And it's Liverpool in 15 days. The seven seas her name will praise. Wind in her hair and her sails unfurled. She's the fastest ship in all the world. And her name is Marco Polo. The keel's all bent, she'll never sail. Heave around and let her fly. James Smith's hopes are doomed to fail. There's no ship here can match her. He's felt the wrath of jeers and scorn. She's like a demon sailing by. Through the pain, the legend's born. There's no ship here can catch her. And it's Liverpool in 15 days, the seven seas her name will praise. Wind in her hair and her sails unfurled, she's the fastest ship in all the world, and her name is Marco Polo. Enough of this music and moaning about James Smith and his Queen of the Seas. Ha! What about me, her captain, James Nickel Forbes? It was I who recognized her potential to carry people instead of wood. Her timbering was enormous, and her sheer size told me she could carry a thousand passengers. There was gold in the colony, and a lot of people wanting to get there. Not to mention the thousands of impoverished people fleeing the slums of Britain. of money to be made. So I moved fast and convinced my friend James Baines, a ship broker, to purchase the Marco Polo. He who could dock a corpse back to life had a refitted to carry passengers within a month. My editor-in-chief assigned me to do an illustrated story on this new ship recently purchased by the Blackball Line. James Baines is having a déjeuner to introduce his new ship to the elite of Liverpool. As I walked through her dining salon, I marvelled at her upholstery, embossed in crimson velvet, suited for kings and queens. Among the invited guests is James Smith from New Brunswick, the ship's builder, who seemed to be withdrawn as he sips his tea. In contrast, Mr. Baines and her new captain, Mr. Forbes, take great delight in toasting each other and the future of the Liverpool shipping industry. As the afternoon wore on, Forbes, in good spirits, said we shouldn't be surprised if he had the Marco Polo to Australia and back in the Mersey six months hence. Ha! Huh. Ridiculous, everybody thought. Six months? No ship had ever done that. The world is round, not flat. I will use the shorter Great Circle route and take the Marco Polo far south through the Roaring Forties to Australia and then sail her across the Pacific, around the world, back here to Liverpool. Bongos! Celebration bongos! Holy forfeits are like that. Yeah, lady, forfeits are like that. Put your forfeits in there, come on. Put your bongs in there. Go for the best. Pay for it, you know. And so it went. On July the 4th, 1852, I pulled anchor and set sail. Australia bound, the gold rush is on!
on board is like living in a small city with her 930 passengers and crew of 16. The Marco Polo is a floating city that offers a well-equipped hospital with two surgeons, a small jail, a library and a weekly newspaper. Not to mention a small farm where fowl and livestock are pen encaged. Until, of course, required by Cook. The person in charge of all this is Captain Forbes, who acts with the authority of a Lord Mayor. Out at sea, two days. Below decks, the steerage class was like illustrating the London Zoo. The children were way out of control. What's going on? Give me that. What have you got? Your father's best tea. Among the mothers of these young ruffians, I was attracted to Jenny. Her simple beauty was a pleasure to me. I grew fond of her. Until, of course, life being what it is, she informed me that the reason for her trip to Australia was to join her criminal husband, Robert, who'd been transported to the Australian penal colonies two years ago. Such a pity. Fourteen knots. The band playing and dancing in the evening. The black cook, Dr. Johnson, went into the wrong bed last night, being a little on the fly in whiskey. The captain came down on the second deck and warned people that there will be no singing or playing of cards after eight o'clock. He talked to them in the right style. I was looking down through the hatchway and said, Hear, hear! Without rules and regulations and sticking to them amongst so many passengers, we should never reach our destination. Out at sea, 12 days. Steward! There's no drinking amongst the crew, you idiot! It's not for nothing that Captain Forbes is known as Bully Forbes. Today, Bully caught one of the stewards carrying a bottle of spirits to some passenger on deck after hours. Bully became enraged and struck him several times with a large glass ship lamp. He broke his nose and cut his face in several places. The captain has an obsession to reach Australia in record time. The Marco Polo has responded to his every command. He will not tolerate anything less from his crew. Out at sea, 15 days. The young woman who I visited several times at the hospital died, and a happy release for the poor creature and her friends. She was thrown overboard about an hour after her decease. She did not sink through carelessness in not putting enough holy stone. She was last seen floating on the waves towards a distant shore. I was moved by the prayer. The clock struck 12. Crack! The snuff box opened. We only had one. Oh, it was a special tin soldier. Oh, I miss him dearly. Oh. Robert! Robert! Poor Jenny. Robert. If only I could Robert. help. It pains me oh. greatly to see her so delirious. Is the thought of one day soon, I will once again be in the arms of my dearest husband, Robert, who has yet to see our last born son. Oh! How his life has been working in the penal colony. All he did was steal to put bread on our table. Oh, I miss him dearly. Robert! Oh, oh. my children. Oh, my wee ones. My wee ones. Oh, 
Of the 327 children on board, 52 will die before we reach Australia. The measles epidemic was brought on board in Liverpool and there is nothing anybody can do. It's a very light night with a very large circle around the moon. Notes for September 2nd, 1852. A cow fell through a hatch on the upper deck, crashed through the second deck hatch, and ended up in steerage. The poor animal was neither killed nor any bones broken. However, she did groan painfully. The unfortunate animal will have to be left among those poor passengers in steerage for the remainder of the voyage. As they will suffer the complications of her company, it is hoped that they, rather than first class, receive the benefit of her milk. Out at sea, 45 days. There's no ship here can match her. She was ruled with an iron hand. She's like a demon sailing by. When bully forms was in command. There's no ship here can catch her. And it's Liverpool in 15 days. The seven seas her name will praise. The wind in her hair and her sails unfurled. She's the fastest ship in all the world. And her name is Marco Polo. Half a gale and heavy seas. It made us roll awful. Breaking plates, upsetting forms, giving young ladies black eyes by being thrown from their berths. Upsetting soup, breaking legs, heads and so forth. Passengers tumbling from one end of the deck to the other. The wind picked up even more. They were not shortening the sails. You could see fear in the eyes of the crew. We all thought we might meet our maker, but not the captain. <laughs> to hell of Melbourne! Tighten up those sails. She can handle the roaring forties and then more. When, when, give me more when! Ha, ah, Smith, she's even better than what you thought. Now, she's mine! Halifax! Halifax! How many days out? The first vessel we'd seen in a month. She proved to be the Halifax from London, and her captain was flabbergasted when he was informed we were out only 68 days. 68 days. Bully Forbes was glowing with pride, for he knew then that he and the Marco Polo would become famous. Marco Polo's a very fine ship, fastest on the sea. On Australia's strand we soon will land, bully Forbes he can look for me. Gonna jump that ship in Melbourne town, gonna dig in gold. There's a fortune found beneath the ground where the eucalyptus grows. Marco Polo, fastest on the sea. Marco Polo, fastest on the sea. Said the black ball owner, Mr. Baines, to bully Forbes one day. It's up to you to keep your crew while the gold pulls them away. Said bully Forbes to Mr. Baines, I have a plan so fine. 
Leave it to me and you'll agree I'm king of the black bow line. I quickly learned that keeping a crew was an art in Melbourne. Forbes charged his crew with insubordination on reaching port, where he would have them all jailed until he was ready to sail back to England. Other captains were not so cunning, and the harbour was filled with hundreds of unmanned ships looking for crews. The gold fields had lured them all away. Let it be remembered that the site upon which Melbourne stands was, only 16 years ago, the resort of the untutored savage and the feeding ground of the wild kangaroo. The gold fields north of Melbourne are blazing with activity, men digging and panning for the gold. The landscape is being scoured by the many thousands who've come from all over the world to seek their fortunes. Among the many who had jumped ship, I met Sam Napier from Bathurst, New Brunswick, who was one of the most fortunate diggers. At Kingower Goldfields, Mr. Napier would find the largest nugget the world had known. It weighed 145 pounds, six ounces. It was 95% pure. The nugget was to be named Blanche Barclay, and Mr. Napier would have an audience with Queen Victoria. I had heard enough about the penal colonies in Australia and my recent warm memories of delirious Jenny going on about her criminal husband there, that this fueled my haunting curiosity and desire to do an article on these infamous penal settlements. I found it difficult to believe that amidst this natural splendor of fauna and flora, that man could create a hell for its own species. Armed with the written permission from the Lieutenant Governor, I visited the new model prison that had just opened at Port Arthur. The Commandant and his guards were a vicious lot. They believed that if a prisoner was isolated from all human contact, in virtual silence, he would contemplate his misdeeds. Such contemplation would lead to his reformation and salvation. To me, flogging the prisoners would be more humane. All was quiet, except in the chapel where the intoxicated minister droned on while his parishioners gradually became insane. The Tasmanian devil must have seemed to be a friendly companion to many lost souls doing time here. Prepare to sail! It's time to earn your wage. Our destination, England. Many would become rich beyond belief, but not the crew of the Marco Polo. After 24 days in detention, they sailed for Liverpool. Forbes did not let up, and the Marco Polo was back to the Mersey in 76 days. I have witnessed history in the making. Today, the 26th of December, 1852, just five months and 21 days after our departure, we are back to Liverpool. The Marco Polo is the first ship to circumnavigate the world in less than six months. Ladies and gentlemen, this last trip 
I astonish the world with the sailing of this ship. Next trip, I intend to astonish God Almighty. Thousands of people came to see this new Brunswick-built ship as she lay in the dock. For here, history had been made. This was the Marco Polo, the fastest ship in the world. And I had the pleasure of being there. Classic Rock C98 is CJY CFM 98.9 St. John, your only home for rock and roll. We'll have the winner in just a moment from our Marco Polo trivia. Also, Kevin is in with news, sports, and weather at the half hour. The big tug of war. That's just a few things happening with Marco Polo uh, and Classic Rock C98. Very happy to be uh, helping out the Marco Polo. We've been running trivia all week long with Justin out the Sun Cruiser. Uh, also, we have the Marco Polo Harbor uh, Yacht Race going tomorrow morning at 10. Don't go away. Four minutes time. You can be the winner with Marco Polo Trivia. Who wrote The Wreck? of the Marco Polo. Was it A, Gordon Lightfoot? Or was it, no, no, I don't think that. The wreck that, of the Edmund Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. Or was it B, Lucy Maud? I'd say Lucy Maud. Yes, it was. And, okay. and uh, here's one for the listeners, too, so don't, don't give it all. All right. What is taller at high tide? Is it A, Shaquille O'Neal doing a slam dunk, B, Mart Simpson's hair, C, the Hilton, or is it D, the Marco Polo? That's a, B, tough. C, or D. That's a tough one, I know. And if uh, you'd like to uh, have a shot at that, we have a great prize for you from the good folks involved with the Marco Polo. It's a book about uh, the Marco Polo written by Flora Kidd and a print. You can have your own Marco Polo right up in the wall. Nice. And that will go to caller number five on the contact lines at 658-2398. We'll be back with the Skywatch weather right after this. The Marco Polo is a positive, inclusive symbol. It is only fitting that the Marco Polo be built to represent the Dominion of Canada. As Canada is the only seafaring nation in the world that does not have a tall ship. Things are happening now. We've got to attract new wealth and this is the... Will Canada have a tall ship? Uh, we hope so and that's a goal that we're working towards. The year 2000 is going to be the largest tour tourism event in the history of the world. And, uh, uh, it's been announced the largest fleet in the world will be sailing by the Bay of Fundy. So to get the Marco Polo 2 in Halifax in the year 2000, that's not all that far away. Why um, bring it to Halifax? Why not have Marco Polo 2 and all the tall ships in St. John? <laughs> St. John is the home port of the largest tall ship fleet in Canada. New Brunswick built 50% of the tall ships. Let us pray. We bless your name for the resources of this great land of Canada and the resourcefulness and wisdom of those who have built sailed and now recognize the importance and national contribution of the tall ships of St. John, New Brunswick. Especially, we commend the ship which excelled all others, the Marco Polo, and its builder, James Smith. I could never quite understand why people pray for those of us who are dead. We have lived our lives complete. Prayers should be devoted to the living. After all, it is you who need them. Just a matter of time then. I mean, there's, there's the sales pitch. I feel the that. sales pitch continues, but yeah. it's just a matter of that you've got everybody on board. Excuse the pun. I, I think so. Yeah, it's a good pun to have. But I think uh, I think that's yeah. 
Good afternoon, ship lovers of Melbourne. 3DL Radio urges you to drop whatever it is you're doing and join us to celebrate Marco Polo Day. Come and support the people of Canada, halfway around the world, in their quest to build a replica of this fine ship. Did you know that eight... 100,000 Australians can trace their routes to the Marco Polo? That's a lot of people. And I tell you men, when we arrive in this new land called Australia, when we arrive you will be astounded by the beauty of this country. Has anyone seen the captain? Captain! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Order! Hey. Now, the Marco Polo represents a historic link between Canada and Australia, but let it also symbolize the friendship we share today and into the future. Imagine what it must have been like in Liverpool at that particular period, 1845, ah, 1850. Yeah. You've got all the people coming from Ireland in terms of the potato oh, farming. Half potato a million farming, people, yeah. half a million people came from the migration into Liverpool from Britain, uh, yeah. from Scotland and another part of Britain. I used to have big houses down here, yeah. Am I right? And there were 17 people to a room on average. All And all, all uh, Irish immigrants. Over there from the potato family, didn't they? Yeah. You know, you used to remember that house, aren't you? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. yeah, they were, they were building sort of 18, 20. Yeah, there used to be some sort of, even that one along the road there, Genesis. Oh, yes. 20 families in that house. 20 families in the house. And they would be different nationalities every week, wouldn't they? And going on board the immigrant ships. Sea captains and everything. Yeah. Was in there. Yeah. You didn't ever sail with Bully Forbes, Benny Sanders. No. <laughs> Into the ale, hey lads. Ah, history. History is ambiguous, isn't it? It's as ambiguous as the legend of the Marco Polo itself. Of course, Smith built her, but he built her to carry wood. It was I who sailed her around the world in record time. You continued sailing for many years under other captains and delivered more immigrants to Australia than any other sailing ship until time came for you to once again carry wood. You lived a long life. Human nature being what it is, everyone wants to lay claim to the greatness of the Marco Polo. I prefer being simple and true. I created you. I know you loved her. So did I. She made me famous. And I've carried her with me to my grave. She grounded about 300 yards from the shore. And just as she struck, the crew cut the rigging, and the foremast and the huge iron mainmast, carrying the mizzen topmast with it, went over with a crash that could be heard for miles above the roaring of the storm. 
Then the ship broached to and lay there, with the waves breaking over her. My father once said to me, For there to be life, there must be death. Watching you go down from the shore of Cavendish was a young girl of eight. Her name was Lucy Maud Montgomery. You inspired this little girl to write The Wreck of the Marco Polo, and she won her first national prize. Your death gave birth to Lucy, a great lady of Canadian literature. You, my dear, have touched the lives of many and have secured your place in history. You shall forever be remembered as the Marco Polo, Queen of the Sea. Another day, the happy morn laughed out, o'er seas blue, tender as a baby's eyes, where yesterday the stranded vessel lay, blank wavelets sparkled under sunny skies. And now, when August gales are wild and fierce, when waves leap high and cloudy heavens frown, men say with anxious glances seaward east, it was such a day. The brave old ship went down. <laughs>